give you the honor. We give you the adoration. Jehovah Rufeka, Jehovah Mekadesh, Jehovah Karen Yesha, Olamore. We worship you, we adore the one who made everything. Thank you, Master, for this moment. Breathe upon your word and let not one person do the same today. In Jesus' precious name. What a faithful, 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 faithful God we serve. Welcome everyone here, all over the world, connected to this broadcast. It is the day the Lord has made. It's called the Lord's Day. And we shall rejoice and we shall be glad in it. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 15. Bible said, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled one of the things i believe god is doing in this lockdown season is to walk our lives walk our spirits service our lives service our hearts service our destiny the way the motor mechanic will service a vehicle and get us ready for the journey ahead. So I, I believe there are things we have dealt on peace and fear and so on. There are several things that God is dealing with in our lives in order to service our lives and service our destiny. And so today we'll be speaking on and dealing with the matter of bitterness with the subject titled The Trap of bitterness the trap of bitterness he said again looking diligently Hebrews 12 15 lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled in this subject we are going to have four objectives number one understanding bitterness Number two, understanding the roots of bitterness. Understanding bitterness. Then understanding the roots of bitterness. Number three, understanding the disaster of bitterness. The adverse consequences of bitterness. Number four, understanding the escape route or route from bitterness. Understanding bitterness, understanding the roots of bitterness, understanding the disaster of bitterness, understanding the escape route from bitterness. By way of introduction, bitterness is a major temptation, a major challenge in life's journey that takes only the grace of God to escape everybody has been bitter at one point or the other not unforgiveness at one point or the other it takes the grace of god to escape what is bitterness all about first bitterness is the feeling or showing of anger hot or resentment the feeling or showing of anger. This is according to the Oxford Dictionary of English. The feeling or showing of anger, hurt, or resentment because of bad experience or a sense of unjust treatment. Again, it is the feeling or showing of anger, hurt, or resentment because of bad experience or a sense 
of unjust treatment. That anger, that hurt, that resentment that comes because you had a bad experience or because you felt unjustly treated. Bitterness. Number two, this is my definition now. Bitterness is the combination attitudes of unforgiveness and deep displeasure It is the combination attitudes of unforgiveness and deep displeasure at wrong deed. Combination attitudes of unforgiveness and deep displeasure because of someone's wrong deed. You are bitter because you are unforgiving and there is deep displeasure because of someone's wrong deed. What are the roots of bitterness? Number one, I said it already in the definition. First is unforgiveness from human wrong deed or wickedness. Unforgiveness from human wrong deed or bitterness wickedness. You experience a wrong deed from somebody. You experience wickedness from somewhere and it generated bitterness. But I'd like you to take note of three things. For as long as you live in the world, offenses must come four things I will say for as long as you three things for as long as you live in the world offenses must come if you are alive and you haven't died and may you not die before your time if you are alive at all offenses must come you will be offended at times it's the deliberate attempt of the enemy to decrease the quality of your life on it. The devil would deliberately supervise some offenses. In Matthew chapter 18 verse 7. The Bible said, War unto the world because of offenses, but for it must needs be that offenses come. It's compulsory for offenses to come. He said, but warn to the man by whom the offense cometh. It's compulsory. Luke chapter 17 verse 1 to 4. He said, then he said unto his disciples, it is impossible but that offenses will come. But warn to him through whom the offense come. I can, we can stop there. It is compulsory to be offended. So for as long as you are alive in the world, you will be offended. Number two, if you have any level of spirituality, you will be offended. With the aim of ruining your spirituality through bitterness. If you have any level of spirituality, you will be offended. The devil generates offense around spiritual people to break their defenses. I've heard many times that in the kingdom of darkness, one of the things they tell their people to do is to make sure they offend, keep offending Christians so that they can get angry, so the presence of God can leave them, so that they can become vulnerable to destruction. With the aim of ruining your spirituality through bitterness. Forgiveness and bitterness. Thirdly, if you have any future, if you have any, let me qualify. If you have any meaningful destiny, you will be offended. 
with the aim of aborting the future. If you have any meaningful destiny, you doubt you ask Joseph. Joseph's brother moved against him. Somebody who was a full blooded citizen of his country was one day turned into a slave. Let us, the dreamer, comment. Let's sell him and let's see how his dream will come to pass. If you have any future, the devil will organize for you offense. Remember Joseph. So, what are the roots of bitterness? First, is unforgiveness from human wrong deed or wickedness. And I have outlined three things under that for you to expect to be offended. Number two, root of bitterness is resentment from envy and jealousy. Resentment from envy and jealousy. People will be bitter against you and probably move to offend you if they are envious and jealous of you. And you too, <laughs> the ones you are envious and jealous of, you may act in ways that will offend them if you are not controlled by the Spirit. Do you understand that one reason for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as far as the Jews were concerned was envy. The scribes and the Pharisees felt that somebody just showed up who didn't go through their Bible school, didn't go through their theological school, has not been schooled to be among the rabbis or the teachers and suddenly is shining more than them and he's getting more crowd than them. Ay, 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 ay. Matthew chapter 27, verse 15 to 18. Look at what the Bible said. Now at that feast, the governor was supposed or prone to release or wound to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will you that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Verse 18, look at this. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Envy, envy, envy. The miracles, the signs, the wonders Jesus performed, the crowd that followed Jesus Christ pained them. He was in the wilderness, the crowd will follow him there. It pained them more. People were emptied from their synagogues. And out of envy, they organized in bitterness to kill him. You can see the extent to which envy can go. Joseph was a victim of envy. Acts chapter 7 verse 9. I mentioned it earlier on. When Stephen was talking about him. He said, and the patriarchs moved with envy. They sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. Envy, envy, envy. They moved with envy. He was a favorite child of his father. They gave him the coat of many colors. He had dreams that were very big. And they were moved with envy. Look at Paul the Apostle. Acts chapter 13 verse 44. He went into a town and the whole city gathered together. A whole city gathered. And the next Sabbath they came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. And spake against those things which were spoken by Paul. Contradicting and blaspheming. We have been in this town, Paul. You just came yesterday. We are Jews. They sent us here on, on, on mission work. You just came yesterday and emptied the whole city. Envy and began to speak against what 
he was saying and doing. In fact, in one of, in one of those cities, in Acts chapter 17, verse 5, the Bible said they stirred up, they stirred up a mob. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company together, and set all the city on, up, on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Envy. Envy. Unforgiveness from human wickedness. Resentment and envy from bitterness. That will either make you to become a, a, a focus of attack that will generate offense. And if the envy is coming from you and the jealousy, then you are bitter because somebody appears better than you. You are bitter because somebody has placed him, somebody is positioned where you are not. And scripture say, No man taketh this honor upon himself except he that is called. A man can receive nothing from above except it be given to him from above. Oh, forgiveness from human wickedness resentment from envy and jealousy and the third root of bitterness is frustration from confrontations temptations or delayed expectations frustration from confrontations temptations or delayed expectation where a person is having so much challenge around them temptations around expectations delayed if you are not careful you just become bitter there are things you are expecting they haven't come seem to be a lot of battles around just become very bitter bitter against everything bitter against society I know of people who talk against everything and everybody. Nobody is good. Nothing is working. Everybody is bad. I know if a young man like that is almost 50 years now, not married yet. He talks about everybody against everything. Very, very bitter. As far as he's concerned, everybody conspired to hate him. Everybody conspired to block him. When there is such situation of delayed confrontations, temptations, delayed expectations, you see the sweetness of, of the spirit disappear. Angry against people that he thinks should help him and haven't helped him. And in fact, in some cases, angry against God. Bitter, in fact, against God. I'll talk about that shortly. Job was in that category along the line. In Job chapter 7 verse 11. And I'll talk about that later on. He said, therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Fucking. And it's God he was challenging. I'll give you more scriptures towards the end. So we have these roots of bitterness. Unforgiveness from human wrong deed or wickedness. Resentment from envy and jealousy. You have frustration from confrontations, temptations, and delayed expectations. What is the disaster of bitterness? Why is it that bitterness is danger? Number one, bitterness troubles the system. It troubles the system. We read in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 He said looking diligently Lest any fail of the grace of God In case any root of bitterness Springing up trouble you Trouble you, trouble you It troubles the system And many be defiled And actually diseased The seed Or the root of bitterness Will produce the fruit of trouble Trouble, systemic trouble There are destructive hormones. Medically, cortisol, corticotrophin releasing hormones that come into activity when the system 
is filled with, in, with negative emotions. Feelings of bitterness and anger and depression. They release some hormones in the system. And these things are, and these are devastating hormones. These hormones will cause what some, in some places is called psychosomatic heal, illnesses. Mind related sicknesses. Mind body connection, connection sicknesses. Include various forms of arthritis. Include some, include ulcers. Includes hypertension. Include migraines. In some extreme cases, cancer. Now, the, that is not to say that any of all the things mentioned are only caused by bitterness. No. Bitterness will accentuate, facilitate them. I remember we visited a woman some years ago, my wife and myself. And she was dying of a terminal disease, cancer to be precise. And while we were in the process of praying for her, the Holy Spirit said to us, ask her to forgive her husband. And we asked her, you need to forgive your husband. Any challenge? Oh. She said, oh, I can't forgive the man. I can't forgive the man. What happened? She said they grew up together, built their home together. Duplex and so on, properties. Only for the man to kick her out and brought another girl to inherit her sweat. People can, men can be at times, human beings can be at times very wicked. And do to fellow human beings what even animals wouldn't do to animals. Kick the woman out and brought a girl in to enjoy the sweat of the wife of his youth. This woman got bitter, found it difficult to forgive the man. She didn't recover. You understand so if the devil wants to trap your life he organizes for you offense organizes for you bitterness it will never be your portion in the name of jesus christ in matthew chapter 18 verse 34 to verse 35 scriptures said and the lord his lord was rough and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him so likewise shall my father heavenly father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses tormentors tormentors afflictors bitterness troubles the system number two bitterness attracts fruitlessness fruitlessness fruitless labor labor without fruit Bitterness antagonizes fruitfulness. You remember the case of Sarah, Hannah, who was trusting God for a child. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9 to 10. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9 to 10. So Sarah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh. And after they had drunk, now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul. Bitterness. Don't know against who, against God, against not, whatever. And prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Eli was monitoring her. Jumped to verse 14. And Eli said unto her, How long will you be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not your handmaid for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, that is bitterness again, have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. And the Lord grant the Lord of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. Look at this now. So the woman went her way and did it. And her countenance was no more sad. She was bitter. Bitterness died. I'm still in verse 18. 
she was bitter bitterness died she was sorrowful sorrow disappeared and then see the outcome in verse 19 and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the lord and returned and came to their house to rema and elkanah knew hannah his wife and the lord remembered her they had had marital relationship all these years no result but when sorrow left and bitterness left fruit came I heard the story from one of God's servants who said he was ministering somewhere in Kano many years ago and a woman had been trusting God for the fruit of the womb for about 13 years and the woman came in the line and was praying and the Lord what do you want fruit of the womb okay God said you should go and forgive your husband and she went and really forgave her husband and became pregnant immediately immediately bitterness it forbids fruitfulness I came across a story I think from Zig Ziglar where he mentioned about an experiment we had some cows in a dairy farm an experiment concerning the emotion of animals and their production there was a study it was discovered that when the animal is stroked the cow I don't know what the female cow is called now is stroked at the back parted and spoken good words to the milk that flows is plenty and is sweet very voluminous it pours when the animal is maltreated they hit it and speak bad words to it the milk that flows out is scanty and bitter scanty and bitter scanty and bitter and sour but what is happening in your mind affects what can come out of your life bitterness forbids fruitfulness it attracts fruitlessness number three bitterness leads to wickedness and ends in curses whenever people agree to be bitter they have agreed to actually be wicked bitterness leads to wickedness and ends in curses in second samuel chapter 3 verse 26 to 29 joab killed abner and when joab was come out from david he sent messengers after abner which brought him again from the well of syrah but david knew it not and when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died. For the blood of Asahel, his brother, this is Joab, shedding the blood of war in time of peace. Go again. And David said, and I thought when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of abner the son of Ner, let it rest on the head of joab and all his father's house and let there not fail from the house of joab one that has an issue or that is a leper may his family never lack a leper may his family never lack somebody who has a problem or that is crippled that leaneth on a staff or that falleth on a sword people will commit suicide there that falleth on his sword, all that lacked bread, people will be beggars. Kaya. This is David, anointed prophet David, was releasing venom on Joab. Because with bitterness, he killed a man who only came to greet David. Abner came to say, David, Abner was the commander in chief of Saul's army. He said, we have come to surrender to let you know God has given you the kingdom. We bow for you. I want to hand over the kingdom of Saul to you. That was the kind of man. And on his way out, Joab called him to the side. As if he wanted to speak quickly. You know, later on, <laughs> later on, David was still speaking. He said, diet Abner like a dog. Will Abner, a general, die like a dog? He said, your hands were not tied. You only died in the hands of, of a wicked man. I wish he had told you he wanted a fight. You would have fought it out. <laughs> 
Say, but from today, for this bitterness, Joab, in your family, lepers will be plenty. In your family, people with challenge will be plenty. In your family, cripples leaning on stick, they will be plenty. In your family, people who will fall on their sword, they will be committing suicide like water. And, it, and David never rever reversed it. Do you know what happened? When David was handing over his kingdom to Solomon, he, remember, he reminded Solomon of Joab. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 5 to 6. Moreover, you know also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me. What he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jetha, whom he slew. He shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and his shoes that were on his feet. Therefore, do according to your wisdom. Don't let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. Don't let him die natural. That is, execute him. Don't let him die natural. Execute him. So, when Solomon said, go and call Abner. Joab, let him come. Joab ran to the temple and held the horns of the altar. He said, I better die here. He said, okay, fall on him there. Bitterness leads to wickedness and it brings causes. If you don't want to be wicked tomorrow, don't be bitter today. And if you are bitter today, you will be wicked tomorrow. And if you are wicked tomorrow, you invite causes on yourself and your generation. Bitterness is the foundation for witchcraft. Very important. Number four, bitterness brings death. It brings death. Look at what Job said in Job chapter 21 and in verse 35. Job 21, 35. He said, suffer me that I... Alright, Job 21, 20, 21, 25, please. He said, and another diet in the bitterness of his soul. And never eat it with pleasure. Another diet in the bitterness of his soul. Bitterness expedites death. Another diet in the bitterness of his soul. I, said, I saw in scripture that one of the reasons why God must have told Isaiah to tell Hezekiah to set in his house in order for he shall die and not live. One of it, I believe, was bitterness. In Isaiah chapter 38 verse 15, when, Joab, uh, when Hezekiah began to speak to God, he said, what shall I say? He has both so spoken unto me and himself has done it. I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. Look at verse 17. Behold, for peace, I had great bitterness. That is, instead of living at peace, bitterness filled my heart. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all my sins behind my back. Bitterness is sinful. I'll show that to you shortly. You see? Instead of being at peace, I was enjoying bitterness. Only your mercy, Lord, is delivering me from this pit. Without any doubt, there are those who have died prematurely from everything. From lack of divine defense, from afflictions in the system, from enemy arrows because of bitterness. Number five, bitterness forbids pleasure. We just saw that in Job 21 and in verse 25. It forbids pleasure. He said, and another diet in the bitterness of his soul and never eat it with pleasure. Bitterness forbids fulfillment and satisfaction in life. You can never be truly fulfilled and satisfied in life for as long as bitterness runs your life. It will only be disfavor, pressure, discomfort, pressure from bitterness. Number six, bitterness brings bondage. It brings bondage. Acts chapter 8 verse 21 to 23. Acts chapter 8 verse 21 to 23. Peter speaking to Simon, the sorcerer. He said, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. When he was asking for the gift of God because, with money. He said, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. 
Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive, next verse, that I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. When a person is in the gall of bitterness, he must also have the bond of iniquity. Bondage, bondage, bondage. There are some there are some oppressions, some, some, some oppressive situations, some, some, some yokes and chains around people's lives that can only be untied when bitterness is released. When bitterness is released. We read earlier on where Jesus handed somebody over to the tormentors in Matthew chapter 18 verse 34 to 35. Tormentors, torment because they refuse to forgive their neighbor. Is God speaking to anybody here at all? Oh, I am being pursued by masquerades in the night or I have this kind of afflictions or that and that and that. Just check and be, and be sure that bitterness is not part of the thing that tied your life. You're untied and it is over. Number seven, bitterness aborts destiny. Dash. It holds your life down in the past. Bitterness aborts destiny. It holds your life down in the past. Because the bitterness most times is, is tied to something that happened yesterday. And until you, lay, you let go of yesterday, you don't lay hold of tomorrow. Paul the Apostle said, in Philippians chapter 3 verse 13, Philippians chapter 3 verse 13, Brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting, forgetting those things which are behind, I am reaching forth unto those things which are before. Forgetting the things which are behind, reaching forth to the things which are before. Forgetting the things which are behind, reaching forth to the things which are before. Forgetting the things that are behind, Reaching forth to the things which are before. Until you forget the things that are behind you. You can never access the things that are before you. These things in the past are holding you from the things of tomorrow. The boyfriend that jilted you or the man that was meant to marry you. That did not marry you again. That you are still holding very tight in your heart. Is preventing you from getting married to who you are meant to marry. That job you lost. That you are still so bitter against your former employee is preventing you from accessing what is yours in the future. Don't let the devil ruin your life by bitterness. You know, Joseph's destiny was achievable because of the extent to which he released his brethren. After his father's death, his brothers, Joseph, his brothers came and said, we are sorry. We are sorry. This and that. And look at how he answered them. In Genesis chapter 50 verse 19 and 20. Joseph said unto them, all to wait to 21, said unto them, fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Joseph never revenged. In fact, he cleaned what they did against him from his heart before they arrived. That was how he could achieve such a great future. I mean, if he was having such a resentment in his heart, he would have died in prison. The gift of vision and revelation and interpretation of dreams, none of them could have manifested. Bitterness aborts destiny. It holds your life down in the past. Prevents you from arriving at your future. You know, when Joseph gave birth to his children, he called the first one Manasseh, which means I have forgotten. Second one, he called him Ephraim, which means fruitful. Nobody can be fruitful in the future who has not forgotten things in the past. I have forgotten. This is Manasseh. <laughs> Everything I passed through, I have forgotten. This, and then after he had forgot, then fruitfulness came, Ephraim. This is fruitfulness. I am fruitful in the land. 
I don't have the time. You can check it out. Forgetfulness of past offense is key to fruitfulness in the future. Number eight, bitterness frustrates Let me put it this way. Bitterness antagonizes answers to prayer. Bitterness. It antagonizes answer to prayers. Effective, productive, answered prayer is jeopardized by bitterness. Mark chapter 11 verse 25. Mark 11 25. Jesus said, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anybody, that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. If you have anything against any, forgive. When you stand praying, when you stand praying, that is forgiveness, your, the state of your heart regarding forgiveness and bitterness affects your prayer life. There are people who have prayed for donkey years and it looks like answers are not coming. Check your heart. What heart is it that you have not let go? Number nine. Bitterness establishes your guilt before God. Whenever you are bitter and you are unforgiving, you remain guilty before God. Alright, let me, let me explain. Until you are able to forgive others, you remain unforgiven by God. Mark 11, 25. He said, we read it just now. If you have any ought against any, forgive if you have ought against any that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Matthew chapter 6. Okay, but if you do not forgive, neither will your father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Matthew 6, 14 to 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Do you know the meaning of that? Somebody took what belonged to you mistakenly and you can't forgive them. Then God said, I also will not forgive you. The lie you lied 15 years ago is still standing against you in judgment. How much more? I will not forgive you of the abortion. Either you committed or you assisted or you contributed, I won't forgive you. See, if the sin of that person is, is too big for you to forgive, your own is bigger. I can't forgive you. Terrible. Bitterness. It establishes your guilt before God. You, you remain guilty for as long as you remain bitter. Finally, number 10. Bitterness disconnects people from the presence of God. It disconnects people from the presence of God. Bitterness disconnects people from the presence of God. It is a straight line equation. If you are bitter and unforgiving, if you are bitter and you refuse to forgive, you have not been forgiven. So your sins are with you. And if your sins are with you, it separates you from God. It's a straight line equation. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 to 2, he said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, 59 verse 1 to 2. Behold, the Lord's heart is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. He said, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear you. If you did not forgive, your sins are with you. If your sins are with you, it separates you from God. Do you understand that? And I'm not talking of separation just on the earth here. You can't feel God's presence here. And you can never by mistake appear in heaven. There are people who have never slept with a man in their life. They, 
They died as virgins, but they could be in hell because they refused to forgive somebody. Never told the lie, never drank alcohol, never smoked. But they beat and I mean, can you imagine yourself ending in the same hell with killers? And all you did was you, you refused to release somebody. God forbid. I heard the story of a man who died. And this man has labored in the gospel. I think he, he had fasted days. I mean, things like 30 days, 21 days, 40 days. Fasting was just like drinking water. And he died. And the Lord told him, return back to the earth. Do you know that your is it primary school headmaster or teacher that you are bitter against and you have ought against? Look for him and, for, and let him and forgive him and let him forgive you, whatever. That had to be done before he could return. And that was that was a rare mercy. I, I, I came across the story of a young man whose mother left him when he was a, a little baby in his father's house. Left him and went and married another husband and never asked of him till he was an adult. He was so bitter against that mother. So bitter. When he saw the mother for the first time, he cried. He said, you did this to me. You gave birth to me. You left me. You didn't ask of me. He couldn't forgive. One day he had a, a message such as this. And he forgave and released the mother. And he said, for the first time in his life, he felt the presence of God. He felt God. There are people watching me now. You are wondering whether your mother is really your mother. Because of the way she had acted against you. I've seen, heard people say, is that woman, except that they say she gave the birth to me, I'm not sure she gave birth to me. Some father, let go. I've seen in my medical school, one of the lecturers told us, told the story, I think it was a maxillofacial surgeon who talked about how a lady was dying of leukemia and she was a nurse because of unresolved issues between her and her father who quickly married a new wife after his mother died and nobody explained to the little girl you just saw the, the mother being put in a, a box and being covered and being put in the head as far as she was concerned, what kind of wickedness is this? Why would they push my mother into a, a container, cover her, would she breathe, push her into the ground? She grew up with pit, and then the father rapidly married a new wife that didn't treat her well. She was so bitter until she had blood cell cancer. And doctor must have been a Christian spiritual doctor said are you is there something and he, he told the story and he said go and forgive your father forgive your father in six weeks of releasing blood cell returned back to normal without any issue of therapy or treatment bitterness it disconnects people from the presence of God this is the final part of this message and I trust God to be as fast as I can. What is the way out of bitterness? The way out of bitterness. Having understood the damaging consequences of bitterness. It is crucial that we get out of bitterness as fast as you can. Get out of bitterness. Get out of unforgiveness as fast as you can. What is the way out of bitterness? Before I tell you the way out, there are three realms where people can be bitter. Three realms. One, bitterness with people. That is with those who offend with people. Number two, bitterness with self. Bitter, you are bitter with yourself. Now, I'll talk about that very shortly. 
And number three is bitterness with God. Anger with God. Let's deal with bitterness with people. Somebody hurt you, mother, father, brother, sister, loved one, employee, employer, whatever. Bitterness with people. There are five things I would like you to know that will help you to release the people. Release the people for the following reason. Number one, it hurts your life and your destiny far more than the person who offended you. It hurts, it hurts you. I heard many, many years ago from the man of God called Ray McCullough in South Africa. Many, many years ago. I was preaching on television. He said, bitterness is like a person drinking poison and affecting the other person to be harmed by the poison this one is drinking. You are the one drinking the poison and you want the other person to be harmed. It doesn't work. Release the people. Release them because it hurts you. It hurts your life and destiny more than call it the offender. Bitterness hurts your life and destiny more than the offender. More than anything it does to the offender. Number two, you are forgiven only when you have forgiven. You are, you are forgiven by God only when you have forgiven others. That's reason, critical reason why you must release people. For as long as you don't release people, you can never be released. You are forgiven by God only when you have forgiven others. Number three, the offender is God's responsibility to handle in judgment. Whoever offended you, is God's responsibility to handle in judgment. That was what Luke chapter 17 verse 1 to 2 said. Then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible but that offenses will come. He said, but woe unto him by whom the offenses come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he is cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. It's better. The, 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 the person who offended you is God's responsibility. He would deal with them. Leave them in the hands of God. But you release them. Romans chapter 12 verse 19. Romans 12 19. Look at what he said. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Don't don't take vengeance in your hand, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I will repay. That one who is busy up and down, breaking people's hearts. You are not interested in marrying a girl. You propose. Whenever you get what you want, you move on. And you move on. Pay day is coming. Pay. I knew a man who, that was his stock in trade. Plenty women. He didn't die well. He didn't die well. That he suffered very well on earth before he died. You are there causing pain and tears to people. Calling yourself a kidnapper or a, a, a robber, a killer. Your, 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 your payment will start in this world. And you will see hell before you enter it. Except you repent. So leave, leave, leave it in the hands of God. The offender is God's responsibility to handle in judgment. Number four, human action. What do you need to know to be able to forgive easily? Human action can never frustrate divine purpose. In fact, it may facilitate it. That is, there is nothing a man can do against you that will stop what God wants to do with your life. If you are willing. There is nothing somebody will do or say that can hinder what God is planning to do for you. So, human action can never frustrate 
divine purpose. In fact, it may facilitate it. That is true with Joseph. We read that already. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20 to 21, where he told his brethren, you meant evil, but God turned it for good. People may try to walk against you, act against you, do things against you, but God turns it out for good. Some bitterness and hatred pushed you to become more prayerful, pushed you to become more spiritual. That's right. Can never frustrate God's purpose. The Bible said the princes of this world are lamenting. Had we known, we would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Had we known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, know that. Know that. Know that. Finally, God's grace is sufficient for all situations. Is sufficient for all situations, including the grace to release, to forgive. Release your bitterness. Let go of the people. Grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9. He said, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. Lord, I am struggling with forgiving this person. I am struggling with releasing this one. Help me, Lord. I don't want to go to hell. When I hear their name, when I come across them, let me, let my heart be calm. Help me. And if you are desperate, God will help you. So that is the number one. Bitterness against people. Know that and do that. You might, you might want to call up somebody. You might want to reconcile with somebody. You might want to apologize to somebody. Now when I say release the people from bitterness, I am not saying become hand in gloves in relationship. That's not what we are saying. You don't have to be the friend of everybody. You love everybody. But you, you befriend people selectively. Okay? That's not what... A, a, a man who wanted to kill you before. I'm not saying go back and be friends with the man. No, no, no. Release him from your heart. And don't be bitter. But wisdom demands that if somebody wants to kill you before, you give space. So, so that there is no confusion. Very important. Release your bitterness against people and you know that fully. Number two, release your bitterness against yourself. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. I am saying that because some people, they are worse enemies themselves. There are people who can't stand to look at themselves in the mirror. You just look at them and just hate them, what they see in the mirror. Look at this wicked you. Look at this useless you. See your useless behavior. Things they did years ago that they can't forgive themselves today. Listen to the following. It might help you to release yourself. One, you may have experienced failure, but you are not a failure. Failure is not a person. It may be an event or an opinion. Because some failure situations are actually schools. You may have experienced failure, but you are not a failure. And you shouldn't see yourself as such. Micah chapter 7 verse 8 said, Rejoice not against me, O, o my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be light unto me. That's number one. Number two, you may have done terrible things in the past, but you are not a terrible person. For just two reasons. God made you in his image. He's not a terrible God. Wicked person. And second, God made you in his image. And second, God redeemed you with the blood of his son. I don't have the time. First Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. If any man is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 God made man in his own image and God said be fruitful 27 28 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 if we walk in the light as he is in the light 
we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. You may have done terrible things in the past, but you are not a terrible person. And even if you consider yourself a terrible person, the blood of Jesus gives you a new life. It rebrands you. It rebrands you, rebrands you, renews you, gives you a new beginning. Now I'm speaking to somebody here. You did 10 abortions, 12 abortions, killed many people you don't know their number, stole, did terrible things. Rahab the harlot was a harlot. But she became so renewed until she became one of the matriarchs in the, in the lineage of Jesus. Became the great grandmother, Rahab the harlot. If you read Matthew and read the genealogy, you will see Rahab's name there. Her name was in the Bible. It's in the Bible. God told Jacob, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Genesis 32, 28. I know that Israel is who you used to be like. A Jacob is who you used to be, but Israel is what you shall be now. They have called you Jacob, which means fraudster or con man, but you are not that. That's, not, that's what they call you, but that's not who you are. Forgive yourself. You, are, you, may, you may have experienced failure, but you are not a failure. You may have done terrible things, but you are not a terrible person. Thirdly, why will you, what do you need to know to forgive yourself and to be, release yourself from bitterness? Number one, number three, you can't walk backwards into the future. You cannot walk backwards into the future. You can't walk backwards into the future. There is no future in the past. Paul the Apostle says, forgetting the things that are behind, I am reaching forth to the things that are ahead. Those things that are behind you, let them remain where, where they belong in the past. I said many years ago to focus on the past is to pass away with the past. Let it remain there and face the future. That's why you must release yourself. The things that happened yesterday, let them remain in yesterday. You can learn from the past to lead in the future. I remember, remember what I said the other day. Keep on moving. Don't lament what you can't amend. Don't over celebrate the success and don't over lament the failure. Just move on. That was number three. You can't walk backwards into the future because there is no future. Dash, there is no future in the past. Number four. Don't waste the present regretting over the past and worrying over the future. Don't waste the moment you have regretting over the past and worrying over the future. It's useless. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 34 in the Living Bible it said, alright, let's start from the King James Version. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. Just face today squarely. Forget the regrets of yesterday and the worry of the future. Just face today. And finally number five. The best way to compensate. Take full care notice of this the best way to compensate for a regrettable past is to over deliver in the present and future the best way to compensate for a regrettable past is to over deliver and by that i mean function far above average in the present and in the future in character, in attitude, in action, over deliver. How did you wish you behaved? How did you wish you acted? How did you wish you carried yourself in attitude? To exceed it now. When that woman that was so called caught 
caught in adultery was brought before Jesus. Jesus said, go and sin no more. That is, go and behave better. Don't sink down into that life anymore. Behave better. Act better. Go and be better than average. I don't condemn you. Just ensure you don't sink back there. Am I communicating? You are about to get married. Every time you are going to get married, you slept with a man before they marry you. And then the marriage is not hold anymore. What do you do next time? No compromise. No. You know, I told you in my university days, if I overslept today, tomorrow will pay for it. That is, that is, if I was meant to do to only one hour or two hours of spiritual exercise, to tomorrow, I will, I, will, I will exceed it by another one hour or two hours more for what yesterday did. <laughs> right. That's the best way. Compensate. To compensate, over deliver today. Exceed. Release yourself. Finally, release your bitterness against God. Release it. I told you how Job was so bitter against God. If you look at Job chapter 9 verse 8, you see many things happen and you are not aware. Job went through things and then the things seemed to linger for a long time. Look at Job chapter 9 verse 8. I read, I read one bit to you already. Job is saying here, he said, he will not suffer me to take my breath. He ha he, but he filleth me with bitterness. If that doesn't make sense to you, look at Job chapter 10 verse 1 to 3. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Show me the reason why you are fighting me. Show me whereof thou contested, contended with me. Is it good unto you that you should oppress? Job is talking to God. That you should despise the work of your own hands. Am I not the work of your hands? And shine upon the counsel of the wicked. It looks like you are favoring the wicked more than me. People. That was Job's experience. And he remained in that condition until in God's mercy, he came to himself. And God had to rescue Job. Beloved, release your bitterness against God for seven of these reasons. Let this help you. Number one, God did not create you to waste you. You were created because you are needed on it. God did not create you to waste you. You were created because you are needed. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, he said, Before I formed you, I knew you. Psalm 139 verse 14 to 15, I was fearfully and wonderfully made. You knew my substance, Psalm 140, 139 verse 14 to 15. You knew my substance before I was even created. Please note, God did not create you to waste you. You were created because you were needed. I hope you wrote it down in full. You were created because you were needed. Number two, God has great plans for your life on earth. Great plans. Jeremiah 29, 11, he said, For I know the thoughts I think towards you. Say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I am thinking well of you. I think it was the Revised Standard Version of those days that says, thoughts of peace and not of calamity, not of disaster, to give you a hope and a future. Is there a translation like that you can show, show, show it for us? To give you a hope and a future. For I know the plans I, ha I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has great plans for your life on earth. Realize that. Number three, God is not responsible for any adversity in your life. He's not responsible. John chapter 10 verse 10 said, The thief cometh not but for to kill and to 
for, for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So divide the line. Divide the line. Anywhere you see killing, stealing, destroying, a devil is involved. The other side you see life, abundant life, meaningful life, quality life, exciting life. God is responsible. Moreover, he said in James chapter 1 verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. No, no, that is, don't let anybody say, it's all right. Don't let, don't let anybody say, God is responsible for my problem. Don't say that. Number four, God is faithful. He's reliable and dependable. God is faithful. He's reliable and dependable. Psalm 89, verse 33 to verse 34. He said, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him? He said, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. God is faithful. From here, you are going to be having exercises to do. First, under this point number four, Identify the faithfulness of God in your life so far. Things that could have been worse if not for God. And appreciate him for them. Just You are beginning a journey of releasing bitterness against God. Identify his faithfulness so far. Whatever you appreciate God for multiplies in your life. So far, areas of your life. Where you say, oh, if not for God, this could have been worse. Yes, there was a problem here, but it's going to be worse if not for God. Identify them. So God is faithful. And it is important to identify the faithfulness of God. Number four. Five now. You can't be angry with your helper and see his help. You cannot be angry with your helper and see his help. The only one who can help you, you are angry with him. Moreover, it is important that you note that the anger of man can never initiate the action of God. The anger of man can never initiate the action of God. You cannot quarrel God into motion. You can't quarrel God into action. Is it in scripture? James chapter 1 verse 20. For the anger of man walketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man. You are angry with God. So take God. Say, okay, that man is angry enough. Let's, let, let, let me give him a wife. <laughs> never. Never. The anger of man can never initiate the action of God. You can't quarrel God into action. The other day I said you can't worry God into action. Very important. So, at this place, there is another action. You repent of that hard disposition towards God. Where you are seeing God as the problem or as behind your problem. Lord, I'm sorry. You cannot be behind my problem no. That was number five. You can't be angry with your helper and see his help. Number six, upgrade your faith in the faithfulness of God. Upgrade it. Your faith in the faithfulness of God. Just upgrade it. To see God at work in your life, you must upgrade your faith in the faithfulness of God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, he said, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Look at scriptures like that. That show you the faithfulness of God. Hear the testimonies of others. Let it warm your heart. 
to convince you that God is real. We used to sing a song. God is God. God is no man. God is God. God is no man. God is God. God is no man. He will do it again. God is God. God is no faithfulness of God. Charge your faith in that realm. And finally, identify action steps you need to put forth that will cause you to see more of his faithfulness in your life. Identify action steps. Things you need to do. Lord, is there something you are requesting from me? The woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5, I believe around verse 35 thereabout was confessing back up a bit she come back up a bit back up a little bit and Jesus on her back up a little bit she said if I she said in her heart if I may touch his clothes I shall be whole that was the action she needed to put forth to see God and she did. Identify. She was in that condition for 12 years. No change. But she came to a point where she knew what to do. Change was instant. You will know in the precious name of Jesus. Beloved brothers and sisters, please go release the people. Release the man. Go. That's right. Release yourself. Go. Release your bitterness against God. And if you are an offender, you don't need anybody to tell you that your assignment is to create pain in people's hearts. Go and ask for mercy so that God may spare you. Go and ask. Go and apologize where you hurt people. I'm sorry I hurt you. Apologize to your wife, to your husband, to your child, to your parents do so to your brothers your loved ones and I believe it's a new day if there is no reason to do this for the sake of your soul for the sake of eternity so we don't end in the same hell with killers see he that hated his brother without a curse is a murderer we don't end in that same hell the Lord bless you lift your hands everywhere you are if you want you can be up your, on your feet in your houses and your various places where you are and lift your voice and let's appreciate the King of Kings